Greetings friends, we are so glad you could join us. It is undoubtedly a very challenging time for all of us and the God of the Bible understands our challenges. In fact, if you read the Bible, you will see men and women went through different severe challenges and uh, you know their response is uh, something that is worthy of applause. But at the same time, I feel these stories are in the Bible so that you and I can be inspired by them. Their, their response in crisis is a template for us to help us how we can respond in our crisis or similar to what we are going through right now. So we're going to look at one such story in the Bible and I pray and hope that it stirs you and motivates you to give a godly response, a response that brings glory to God. So our story is in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. This book was written by a doctor called Dr. Luke who is a part of this story. So he's living this story out and he narrates to us how this story goes. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. And we will look at the story that starts from verse 16 onwards. Just to give you a bit of a background before we get into this story, Paul and his companions have been waiting on God to direct them as to where they can go and share the gospel. They tried entering Asia, but God, the spirit of God, the Bible says, forbid them from entering Asia. As they are waiting on the Lord, Paul sees a vision and, uh, in the night and he sees a man from Macedonia calling him, inviting him to come and help them. So Paul and his companions discuss and they conclude that this is God who is calling us to Macedonia. So they pack their bags and they head to the Greek city of Philippi. As they come to the city and they begin sharing the gospel, it begins with women and then gradually men and God begins to open hearts and we see a gospel advance. This is where we are at, at this stage. And then Luke tells us in verse 16, it says, Acts chapter 16, verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. Now Paul and his companions are walking and suddenly a girl joins them. A young girl. She's a slave and she can predict the future. The Bible says she has a spirit in her which enables her to predict the future. So obviously because she was a slave, they had, she had masters and these masters looked at her and said, wow, we found a hen that lays the golden egg. So they said, we can make money out of this. So what they do is uh, they, you know, they make this into a profitable business. So people come to the girl and the girl predicts their future. And this is more like fortune telling and they are making money. But now what happens, this girl begins to follow Paul and his companions and wherever they are going, she goes behind them and starts shouting. What is she shouting? She's saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. Listen to them. They are showing you the way of salvation. They are showing you how you can be saved. Now the Bible tells us that this went on for days. And after many days, finally Paul got annoyed. He got irritated and can you imagine you're going to evangelize somewhere and there is someone who is, you know, you know, very weird voice trying to say things behind you and that's not the way you share the gospel. So Paul is annoyed. Basically, this girl is causing a lot of disturbance and hindrance to the sharing of the gospel. So one day he's had enough. He turns behind, he looks at the spirit and says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out. And at that very moment, the spirit left the girl. Now, the owners realized that finish, the shop is shut. The girl cannot predict anymore because the spirit has left her and now she is back to just being a slave girl. So these people get angry. They are agitated. These owners, they go and they grab Paul and Silas. They drag them to the marketplace. They bring them in front of the magistrates and then they complain. They say, these are Jews. These are Jews who are uh, causing an uproar in our city. They are causing trouble. They are bringing Jewish practices that are alien to our Roman customs. We cannot accept this. We cannot practice this. And they, and they, they manipulate the mob. The mob joins them and they are angry. And you can imagine this is like a riot. And the magistrates intervene. They come and they strip these two men. Paul and Silas are stripped and they are severely flogged. They are beaten with rods. And if that was not enough, they are then handed over to the jailer. They are thrown in the prison. 
In fact, the magistrates instruct the jailer. They tell him, please make sure that you guard these men securely. Now the jailer thinks, oh my goodness, what kind of criminals these are that have got to guard them securely. So he takes no chances. He makes sure that these two men are put inside the innermost cell where it is dark, it's damp, you know, it's a, it's a dungeon. There's no light. And he fastens their feet in the stocks, the Bible says. Now stocks were like these wooden uh, brackets that were put on your feet. They were heavy. They were often made of iron and you couldn't even move. Like, you know, imagine your hand and your feet uh, in stocks. It, this was so heavy. You couldn't move. You couldn't even move. So now I want you to take a pause and think, what are they suffering for? Why are they going through all this? Simply because they have delivered a young girl out of an evil spirit that had possessed her. Is that how you would like to be treated? No, right? You, you would think that, oh, if I do something like this, people will applaud, they will appreciate, they will be in awe of God, they will respond in faith. Right? That is how we expect things to happen. But there is something that, when you read the Bible, there is something that comes across quite often. In fact, there is another story in the book of uh, Mark, Mark chapter 5. You will notice that Jesus had gone from Galilee. He had crossed a river, in fact, faced a storm, calmed the storm, and then landed into a place called Decapolis. And he simply went there to reach out to one man. This man was tortured by demons. He had a legion of demons inside him. And he would cut himself... And, uh, you know, his life was basically ruined and there was absolutely no hope, no hope until Jesus arrived. And then Jesus comes and delivers him of all this demonic oppression. And he sends those demons and the pigs and the pigs go and drown. And there is the man fully cured. He retains sanity. Jesus has delivered him. And then the people come from the different parts of town. They gather and they look at the man and there he is made whole by Jesus. Now what must you do? Obviously you should rejoice because he's one of your own who has been trapped and you know demon possessed for so long and now has been liberated, been set free by Jesus. But you know they look at the man and then they look at the pigs and all those pigs have drowned and you know what? They look to Jesus and say we, they plead with Jesus to leave their town. You wonder what kind of a response is that? You know, instead of appreciating and honoring Jesus, they, act, they literally ask Jesus to go away, to get out. Now, there is a lesson for us in this story and that and so many other stories. That when commerce clashes with faith and if commerce is affected, then often it retaliates. You know, sometimes we have this image, some Christians imagine that if we go around healing people and performing miracles, everybody will come and put their faith in Jesus. Now, I absolutely believe in healing and miracles. Trust me, I believe that we serve a God who heals and who performs miracles. There is absolutely no doubt about it. But it is a wrong thinking to imagine that just because you are healing and performing miracles, people are going to give their life to Jesus. And in fact, look at the story of Jesus. He performed a number of miracles and healings. And yet, for that very reason, you know, because people were turning to Jesus, he was crucified and killed. So let's not live in that bubble. Okay, so moving on, you know, you, you wonder why are they suffering? And more importantly, how would you respond? Imagine being Paul and Silas, beaten, bruised, in excruciating pain, and now you are in a dungeon, you are tied to chains, your feet are in stocks. How would you respond? Honestly, many of us would complain, would grumble, would whine, saying, Lord, why? Why have you done this? Why should we deserve this? It was in your name that we cast out the evil spirit. But what will amaze you is their response. Look at what the Bible says. Verse 25 says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Isn't that amazing? Yeah? So this is where it is. Paul and Silas are in chains. 
they are suffering, their body is hurting and right in the middle of the night, they are not ashamed. They are not ashamed of the gospel. They in fact sing songs to the Lord. They are singing praises. They are praying to God and they are doing it loudly. Remember they are in a more cell. There are other prisoners, other inmates there and they begin to hear. They are listening to the doctrine that they are singing. They are worshipping their God. This must have been goosebump stuff for the other prisoners. Isn't that wonderful brothers and sisters? There is a question for us that we must examine our hearts. Right now we are kind of in prison. We are in isolation, locked down, closed doors. Are we singing? Are we singing? Have we learned to sing in our suffering, in our challenges? They are not singing laments, mind you. They are praising God. There is a place for lament, but this is not the time. They are singing praises. They are worshipping God. They are giving their best. You know why? Because they realize that God is in our midst. God is for us. God is with us. They are assured of God's faithfulness. They are full of joy. You may wonder, what? Joy? How can they be full of joy? The Bible tells us joy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So he who has received the Holy Spirit will cultivate the fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit. And they are in us. They dwell in us. See, people often have a misconception of what joy is and what happiness is. Now, if you look at happiness, happiness is derived by something that is outward. So imagine if someone gave you a gift, a beautiful, lovely gift, you're happy. It's your birthday, you're happy. You're promoted, you're happy. You know? So happiness depends on situations. It depends on feelings and emotions and what happens outwardly. But joy is very different. Joy comes from within. You, know, you derive joy out of knowing who God is. The moment you draw closer to God, He puts joy in your hearts. A joy that no one can take away. A joy that comes out of a revelation of who God is. And that is why they could worship. Because they were joyful. Joyful people worship God. Hallelujah. You look at Paul and Silas. And you wonder why are they singing songs? I want to read an amazing verse to you from Psalm 42. Psalm 42 verse 8 says this. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. Isn't that wonderful? In the night it says your song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. This is precisely what they were doing. They were praying and they were singing. They were living Psalm 42 verse 8. We want to commend these men, don't we? I think they are a great inspiration for us so that we too can worship God and enjoy Him at all times. Brothers and sisters, we are called to be in an attitude of worship always. See, there's this wonderful story told about an old man. He was a Tonga driver. He had a horse and he would go about doing his business, this horse was his source of income. And he was a man who always praised the Lord at all times. The villagers wondering how can he praise the Lord always. But whenever he met someone, he said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And it was not just a jargon, he meant it. Now one day, his horse disappeared. It ran away in the jungle. And the villagers were concerned for that old man. They said, oh my goodness, he's lost his livelihood. So they all came to console him. So we're feeling so sad for you. But you know what the old man said? He said, praise the Lord. They were amazed. How can he say praise the Lord? He's lost his only source of income. But then, three days later, the horse returned. But he didn't return alone. The horse brought along three other wild horses. And now he had four horses. So the villagers were very happy. They said, wow, this is wonderful. To which the old man said, yes, praise the Lord. He said, again, praise the Lord? He said, yes, praise the Lord. So they said, fine, this time it makes sense to say praise the Lord. A couple of weeks later, his young son, who was all of 18, decided to sit and tame one of those wild horses. As he sat on it, 
The horse was a real wild one. He threw him off his back. And the man landed on his knees and hurt himself badly. The doctor said, this will take six months to, re to recover. He's got to be put in a cast and he'll be bedridden for six months. Now the villagers felt very bad. They came to offer their sympathies to the old man. They said, this is so sad. This shouldn't have happened. Oh, we feel so gutted for you. To which the old man said, praise the Lord. People were like, what's wrong with him? Why is he praising Lord, praising God in this circumstance? But he kept saying, praise the Lord. Two weeks later, the military generals came to the village and they said, we are taking every young person, 16 to 20, every young person to get them enrolled in the army. It's going to be a one year rigorous course. No parent wanted to let their young children go, but they had to. They didn't have a choice. But when they came to this old man's house, they saw his son, there he was injured and they passed him by. They said, we cannot take him. It'll take six months to recover. This is a one year course. So we let him go. And they went away. The villagers turned to the old man's house and said, Oh man, this has worked out for you. You are so lucky. To which the old man said, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Friends, we are called to praise the Lord always. Whether it is good or bad or ugly. Irrespective of what our situation is. Let us praise the Lord. Can you say after me? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, moving on. You see, we wonder... What made these two men praise God? What was in them? What was their understanding of God that made them praise God always? The Bible encourages us. It says, be joyful always. Rejoice in the Lord. Paul, years later, would write to the same people who are being saved here. You know, probably the Philippian jailer and Lydia and the others. He would write to the Philippians in chapter, Philippians chapter 4. He would say, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, God wants us to rejoice. In fact, I feel you can have joy only when you know Jesus. Joy, it's my acronym. Is Jesus on you? You know, when Jesus comes on you, he fills you. That is when you feel inexpressible joy. Hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 13 says, Be glad for the chance to suffer as Christ suffered. It will prepare you for even greater happiness when he makes his glorious return. Now you look at the story and as it progresses, there is Paul singing, there is Silas singing, worshipping God, singing hymns, praying, the, the prisoners are listening and then something miraculous happens. The Bible says there is an earthquake, a violent earthquake that even the foundations of the prison are shaken. The doors fling open. Now imagine if you are the jailer. The Bible says the jailer woke up. This was the worst nightmare. The men he was supposed to secure would now must have ran away. So in his panic, he removes his sword. He wants to cut himself, kill himself. He's got, su he's got suicide on his mind. And that's when Paul shouts. He cries out. He says, don't harm yourself. We are all in here. Yes, we had an opportunity to escape, but none of us have escaped. Isn't that amazing? This, this, this very jailer persecuted Paul. It was he who, you know, who put him in the inner cell, who put him in the stocks. He must have been severe with them. But look at Paul. Look at Paul's heart. He responds exactly like how Jesus would respond. Jesus said to his persecutors, he prayed, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. That is exactly in the same way that Paul responds. He says, don't harm yourself. Don't harm yourself. To Paul, the jailer matters. Every soul matters. Isn't that wonderful? And you will see what's going to happen next. You know, once upon a time, Paul was a persecutor. He was persecuting Christians. But when he encountered Jesus, his whole attitude changed. And the persecutor Saul is now passionate, compassionate about souls. 
As soon as the jailer hears Paul's words, he comes and falls at their feet. He says, lights on. He comes and basically lights are on, not only in the jail, there is something that has happened within him. And he comes and he falls at their feet and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul tells him, Believe in the Lord and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he shares the gospel with them, with the whole household. The Bible says they took him in, the jailer took him to their house, washed his wounds, and then they got baptized. And then, I want, to, I want you to see the end. It says, verse 29, The jailer called out for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now verse 32 says, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his whole household were baptized. The jailer brought them into the house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. Isn't that wonderful? What an end to a story like that. Right? See, imagine, here was a man who wanted to kill himself. He was so frustrated with life. He wanted to end it. And then within moments of receiving Jesus, it says he was filled with joy. That is what it does, my friends. When you receive Jesus in your life, irrespective of what's happening around you, you will be filled with joy. I promise you that. Receive Jesus and know this joy that no one else can give you. Nothing that surrounds you can give you. It comes from the spirit that Jesus gives us. It comes from within I want to end by saying two things. Firstly, you know, sometimes when we think of worship, we think of the right tempo and we think of instruments, we think of the decor and we think of uh, the first half of our Sunday morning services that we've not had for a long time. But you know, that, that is what we confine worship to. Now it is true, all that is necessary. You know, we need the right tempo. We need the musicians. God bless them for their talent. But worship is more than that. It is not just an event on a Sunday morning, friends. Worship is an attitude. Worship is a lifestyle. God wants us to worship at all times. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman in John 4 that the Father is seeking worshippers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. That is the kind of worshippers that God is looking at. Can we sing our songs in these times? Remember, your neighbors are listening. Remember, your friends, your extended family are listening. They will listen. Let them listen not to our grumbling and complaining like everyone else is doing. Blaming this one and blaming that one. But let's rejoice. Saying, Lord, we believe in you. We believe that you will perform a miracle. But even in the midst of our challenges, even in the midst of lockdown, we will worship you. We will sing songs of praise. Hallelujah. Worship is not determined by our circumstances. It is decided by our revelation of who God is. Hallelujah. And the last thing I want to say is, here is a wonderful opportunity for us. Paul and Silas grabbed the opportunity. Later, Paul writing to the Ephesians would say this in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16. He would say, the days are evil, so make the most of every opportunity. I want to encourage you. Seize the opportunity, brothers and sisters. Let us sing songs of praise and worship to the one who deserves it. Hallelujah. I'd like to end with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for these men, Paul and Silas, and for the wonderful response that they gave in the midst of their challenge, in the midst of their suffering. Lord, we know that you are watching over us. You are sovereign, Lord. You know each of us and our challenges at this time. Lord, yet we want to sing to you. We want to sing our songs of joy, our songs of praise, our songs of worship, because you deserve it. We want to give you our very best, not grumbling and complaining, 
for praising you, exalting your matchless name. Help us to do that, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you.